I'm very, very happy to be here. I always love coming to this place, feel that I'm among brothers and sisters who think very much alike. And so it's been a real blessing to me to be involved in some way with, and, and friendship with some of the people here. My, this is my wife's first uh, uh, visit here, and she's here. Uh, <laughs> I always say that she's the one who practices what I preach. <laughs> if one, one person does it, it must be working, so it's okay. <laughs> Um, I, I, uh, Pat asked me to speak on, um, on, uh, 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 from my book, and he particularly asked me to speak on discipline, disciplining children and on teaching children. So uh, that's what I will do. Uh, let me just say before that that this follows uh, two other chapters which I think are also very important. Uh, the first one is called Delighting in Children. And uh, that is that we need to, our children need to know that we delight in them. I, I think I might mention that a little in the talk. Uh, the second uh, chapter before this one is on fun, traditions, and security. Uh, and one of the things I uh, take, uh, you know, uh, very seriously is that our children must know that they have fun with their family. Family is a fun place, and our children, uh, we, we need to play with our children, for example. We need to, um, uh, and it's, it's, uh, these are things they'll never forget. So uh, the, I have a chapter on fun and traditions. You know, children uh, look forward to certain things, and if we can see that those things are there in our children's lives, that's another thing that is very important. So uh, that's, uh, that's part of it. And then I, I, I also say that the balanced life is our cross. Those of you who are involved in some sort of ministry know how difficult it is to give sufficient time to the family. Uh, and um, that is our cross. You know, we can't neglect one or the other. And, and we need to uh, show our children that we are, it's happy. It's a happy thing for us to be involved with them. And that means while you're very tired sometimes, just being around, taking them places and things like that, that is our cross. Uh, it's easy to do one or the other. It's not easy to do both. So that's just by way of uh, introduction. Um, uh, talking about discipline, there is a passage that I want to read. This is Ephesians 6 and verse 4. Fathers... This is actually uh, advice to fathers, but I think it applies to fathers and mothers, both. Um, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. A lot of rich thoughts that are found in that passage. So let me just try and uh, share some of those things with you. Um, four things, actually, that are talked about. One is do not provoke do not provoke your children to anger. The NIV translates this as do not exasperate your children. The context, of course, is discipline. When we are discipline our children, disciplining our children, we cannot be um, unreasonable, unjust, or uncontrolled, which causes a lot of anger among children. Parents often discipline out of personal annoyance. You know, uh, the impression that the children get is father is angry or mother is angry. Not this is for my good or I have done something wrong. That's not the overriding Im impression that comes. The, the impression that comes is father is angry or mother is angry. And how can I avoid this anger? Uh, so... Um, so today there are a lot of hurt people. I have had to speak to several people over the years who have been uh, wounded because, especially father, the father's rage. And also sometimes because the father is an alcoholic and the mother is under so much stress. The mother, um, uh, she overreacts in situations and the children suffer from that. And uh, sometimes I have had to have rituals of forgiving your father uh, for the, the, the rage that 
ruined and made angry, made this person so angry. I don't know whether you've noticed that. Children get very angry when they feel they have been unjustly uh, scolded, punished. And, uh, and so, um, uh, we, uh, so, so we need to bear that in mind. Warren Wearsby talks about uh, a teenager who told him, my father would use a cannon to kill a mosquito, you know, uh, overreacting to a situation. Uh, so we need God's help for disciplining. Uh, Paul, uh, it's a very, one of my nice passages that I like. Paul is in, uh, in uh, Cyprus, and the proconsul of Cyprus, the governor, uh, Sergius Paulus, is interested in hearing the, from Paul. And um, Elimus, a magician, uh, tries to stop him, to resist uh, him speaking. So we are told, Paul, filled with the Spirit, rebuked him, using some rather choice words, right? <laughs> he rebuked him, filled with the Spirit, and said that he's going to be blind. And that's what happened. He got blind for a moment. Now that tells us that we need the fullness of the Spirit for rebuking. We need the fullness of the Spirit for, uh, for disciplining our children. Uh, so uh, so when, when you're disciplining your child, uh, you're praying hard, Lord, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me do the right thing. Uh, so that we will, you know, uh, once you bring God in, it's like he's like an umpire. You know, when you realize that he's around, you have to moderate the way your tone and the way you speak. I think this applies to all marriage. Uh, you know, um, the, the, our first few years, my wife and I are so different in our personalities that we had some interesting times the first few years, <laughs> you know, unable to understand each other. And we had this principle that we won't go to sleep until uh, we have cleared things. So sometimes till 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, we are talking, talking, talking. And during that time, I learned a good principle. With my mouth, I'm talking to my wife. With my ears, I'm listening to my wife. In my heart, I'm talking to God. And what am I saying? Please, God, please, God, help, 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 help. You know? I think, I think we, um, it's very interesting. I did a, st a study on all the times the fullness of the Spirit comes in the book of Acts. And it's not always on situations that we normally talk of. For example, Stephen was filled with the Spirit for death. You know, so, and here, Paul is filled with the Spirit for rebuking. So we need the Spirit's fullness for disciplining. So discipline is something that is, uh, of course, there's a close connection in the Bible, in Luke's writings, between uh, the fullness of the Spirit and prayer. So we pray for God to help us. The parallel passage in Colossians, Colossians 3.21, says, do not provoke your children lest they be discouraged. So sometimes our, when we discipline our children, they become discouraged. Um, uh, and the, that's the opposite of this, this uh, you know, um, of, of, uh, of Sorry, uh, encouragement is the opposite of discouragement. So, so parents, our job as parents is to encourage our children. That's part of our job. And, um, and um, the, the context here, of course, is, um, is discipline. But I think it's very important for us to labor to make our homes places where our children feel welcome, encouraged. I'm important here. Uh, you know, and I, I, uh, you know, agape is, uh, is, uh, is uh, like Christian love. Uh, it's something is decisive. You know, it's, it's, a, it, it's a decision we make. It's not the natural reaction. Paul, uh, that's why the church seems to have chosen a, un, a not a very common word uh, as the characteristic word for love in the New Testament, <clears throat> is agape. Because it's different to normal love. It's, it's unnatural. It's, it's going beyond what is your natural response to a situation. Uh, I, I think in my book I tell the story of a child who has come home 
uh, after from school, and the mother is is really uh, struggling uh, to get dinner ready because a big shot is coming for dinner, and uh, and at that time the child shouts, "Mummy, mummy!" And uh, the mother's first reaction, first impulse, is to say, "What?" You know, angrily because she was annoyed, and instead. She, Agape, is decisive. She decides not to say that and instead to say, what is it, son? And the son says, I was chosen to the football team or the baseball or whatever you have in this country. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, she, uh, she say, and, and then the mother you know, forgets about her cooking and hugs the boy and calls the sister and they pray and the child feels encouraged, welcome, I'm important in this place. So as parents, we have to discipline, but the context of disciplining is the child knows that uh, he's loved, he's admired, he's accepted, he's, uh, he brings joy to his parents. So, um, so, um, so that's, that's another thing, you know, one, uh, so, I don't know how it is here. I haven't heard uh, husbands talking to their wives on the phone. But in Sri Lanka, sometimes I know when a husband is talking to the wife on the phone. It's not very polite, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's as if I'm talking to my home people. I don't have, have to act. I can be myself. You know, I, I'm annoyed, you know, and, and I can express it at home like that, you know. Uh, but, uh, but in the Bible, uh, you know, our conversation is to be seasoned with salt. Gracious, seasoned with salt. And, and I think we have to keep uh, working at this so that our children don't end up with wounds because we have lost control of ourselves. And, and so um, they should know that when we discipline them, the context is, I want you to be a great person. I want you to be this. Uh, Paul in 1 Timothy 1.18 says, Timothy, my son, I give you this, my child, I give you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you. Uh, there were prophecies made about Timothy, which now became the basis of uh, Paul's ambitions for Timothy. And with this ambition in mind, he, these are very, very strong word here, uh, I, I give you this command, he's, uh, he's telling him very seriously, you've got to do this, but it is so that he can be a great person. So sometimes when we discipline, we discourage our children, you're useless, uh, in, in our country, we say you're a donkey, but my editor at Crossface said they don't use that phrase in this country. I don't know. Uh, but uh, you're useless. You're, uh, you're, you're not like your brother, right? Uh, you're, the, the worst thing to say is you bring shame on our family, especially if you're a Christian leader. You know, uh, Chris, ch uh, children of Christian leaders don't do things like that. That's never the reason for us telling our children something. The reason is that it's the best thing for them. We don't ask them to pray because children, our children should be praying. Rather, we ask them to pray because that's the best thing for them. So, um, so, uh, so, so you, you won't foster greatness by putting people down when you rebuke them. Rather, you get, create, it creates a sense of hopelessness which can result in rebellion or depression or inferiority. All three can happen. Uh, Proverbs 3.12 says, The Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Reproof and delighting go side by side. The father reproves uh, the, the son whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. So how important for us, to ch for our children, to know 
that we delight in them. Just let me say, this is from another chapter, but uh, let me say that uh, for that we have to first, we have to first receive God's delight. You know, if, if, if we are not thrilled by the fact that we are loved by God, then uh, we are, it's going to show in the way we respond to people. Because we, we, we um, transmit that sense of rejection that we feel uh, onto others. Uh, the most beautiful thing about our lives is that God loves us. That's the most beautiful thing. And in fact, we are discipling people. That's one of the most important things to make them understand. You are loved by God. You know, uh, Zephaniah 417 puts it well. The Lord your God uh, in the midst of you is mighty. I think you know those words. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will exult over you with loud singing. That word exult, uh, one of the uh, Hebrew lexicons says uh, it means to shriek ecstatically. God is shrieking ecstatically about what? About us. And having received that, then we are able to treat our children with, uh, with that sense of respect and importance. Um, I, I don't know who the, this person is about whom this story is written, but uh, it is said that there was this mother who had many children. Some people say it's Susanna Wesley, the mother of John Wesley, but uh, we, I'm not sure about that. Um, the, this, this woman had th something like 13 children, and her neighbor used to help her, and she used to, she used to be amazed at how peaceful this mother seemed to be. So she asked her one day, you know, I, I can't understand this. You have so many children, but you don't seem to be so stressed out. How do you survive? How do you, how do you manage like this? And she said, can you, can you see this chair? When I sit on this chair, and she ha always had a big apron, and I put the apron over my mouth, uh, over my head. Uh, that's, there's a rule in our house. Mother is praying. Don't make a noise. <laughs> and so whenever she was stressed out, she would go sit down, maybe for a minute or two, and just affirm the presence of God. And that brings back her equilibrium, that she's able to respond to children. So we struggle to survive. Everyone, all of us are struggling. We are all basket cases, actually. You know, <laughs> struggling to survive with all these uh, emotional problems and psychoses and I don't know what. All of us are full of weaknesses. We are struggling to survive, sorely lacking in wisdom, stressed out, but loved by Jesus. And that's the most th important thing about us. We are loved by Jesus. And because Jesus loves us, we have courage to go on and to, to work at being good parents. Now, discipline also helps buttress the self-image of our children. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, it, it gives them the message, you have great potential, and I'm going to help you achieve that potential, and what you've done is wrong, and I want to straighten that out. I want to correct that. I think uh, uh, psychologists um, uh, have, have said that children who are not disciplined, get the idea that their actions are not significant. Because they do wrong, but, they are, but nothing, nothing is done, which suggests that the wrong they do is not significant. And uh, I, I read this in one of James Dobson's early books, I think, um, and it shows how some of these children become delinquents, trying to may be a, create a nuisance so that people will take them seriously. Listen, I'm significant. I can cause a lot of harm. And so, uh, so, um, so we discipline people. So, uh, and, and we do that without exasperating them. The, the, the next thing we are told is that we are, uh, so, so we talked about not provoking, and now we are talking about the word discipline. Uh, the, the, that verse says, uh, discipline your children. Uh, and um, uh, so, so this word 
Um, you, you know, before I say that, uh, before I expound the word, uh, you know, uh, we can go overboard with our sensitivity to our children. And I think that's happening a little in the West today. You know, um, the, we, we are talking so much about the harmful effects of harsh discipline that we are going to the other extreme and not disciplining people at all. Uh, James Dobson says, much has been written about the dangers of harsh, oppressive, unloving discipline. These warnings are valid and should be heeded. However, the consequences of oppressive discipline have been cited as justification for the abdication of leadership. And he says, that is foolish. So Paul says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline an instruction of the Lord. That word discipline actually is the word paideia. Uh, paideia is the word from which we get the word pedagogy, which is the word for ways of uh, techniques of teaching. Uh, so to, uh, what it means is to train someone according to proper rules of conduct and behavior. The context, of course, gives the, the meaning discipline. In other words, discipline is a way of teaching. We teach people through discipline. It's a kind of training. There is punishment, and, uh, and there is, but the punishment is a chastisement. In other words, something that is to help them to change. It is intended to train. Therefore, it is carefully thought out uh, so as to help train. Uh, 12, Hebrews 12, 6 says, the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So, discipline is a way of teaching. Now, let, just let me say something about uh, how important it is for us to be consistent in the way we respond to our children's wrongdoing. Um, you know, um, the consistency is one of the things that builds security in the life of children. And for, the, for us who are in ministry, this is very difficult. I, I have an uncle who's a pediatrician, and that's something he told us when our daughter was very small. Uh, we have a very, you know, we have very unusual schedules. And, and it's difficult for us to be consistent in that way, but we must try as much as we can, especially in the way we respond to situations. Um, for example, uh, there's a common scenario where a child wants something and the mother says no. And then the child cries louder and louder and louder. And the mother just can't handle the sound anymore. And she gives what the child asks for. Now, a very bad message goes to that child. But the, the message that goes is there is no right and wrong. But what the, the key is the comfort and convenience of my mother. If I can make her unbearably uncomfortable, I can get anything I want. You know? And I think this is something that we have to really battle because it's our natural reaction. It's a natural reaction that we have. Uh, we, um, the Bible, of course, is very clear about how our words should be trustworthy. Uh, you know, the Bible says you don't need to swear because our, our words are reliable. Matthew 5.37, uh, let what you say simply be yes or no. James 5.2, let your yes be yes or your no be no. If people don't learn to accept no when they are children, they are going to be very unhappy when they are adults. Because in adult life, there are a lot of things you're not going to get. When you're a children, if you're spoiled, your parents will give you everything you want. But when you're an adult, there are a lot of things you cannot get. And if you're not used to know in your life, you're going to be an unhappy person. And when you are unhappy, of course, others are made unhappy by your unhappiness. So, a great responsibility of teachers, or of parents, is to teach children to graciously accept no, you know? And, um, and, uh, and how? 
by keep being consistent, that you, that, you do, uh, that you have consistency in the way you do that. It's a symbol of reliability and faithfulness. And parents and children, even though may they, they may resent it initially, become secure in the reliability because their parents are principled people who know what is right and what is wrong. Of course, an important part of this is that we don't disagree on discipline uh, in front of our children. Uh, children are very crafty, and they know how to manipulate parents. Uh, you know, the moment father comes home after work, goes, runs to the father and complains about the mother. And if the father gives any indication that he's annoyed with the mother, that son or daughter knows how to use it. To, to, to get what he wants and, and, and to do things that he shouldn't do. And, and this is something that is uh, very important, uh, uh, you know, consistency. Uh, we may disagree on how we discipline another, but we don't disagree in front of the children. We, uh, we, we go home or go, go to our rooms and we talk and uh, seek to uphold each other's position in the family. Now, uh, th there are times, um, you know, this is a way of fostering respect. And this is another feature, I think, that we Christians, uh, I've been recently going through, because I, I work in an honor-shame culture, and I've been trying to decide, think, uh, thinking a lot about how to disciple people in honor-shame cultures. And the key to our culture is respect. And it's a key to the biblical culture. And if it's a key to the biblical culture, it should be a key to every culture. You know, uh, James Robson says that there are times a strong-willed child will clench his fits and dare his parents to accept his challenges. And then he says, uh, he is not motivated by frustration or inner hostility, as is often supposed. He merely wants to know where the boundaries lie and who's available to enforce them. You know, he's, he's trying to do something here. Many well-meaning specialists have waved the banner of tolerance but offered no solution for defiance. You know, I, I think you can go to an extreme with this. I know I have heard people saying that you must hit a child uh, to teach the person, defi you know, to, to, to not to be overly defiant and all that. Uh, and I, I don't want to go into all of that. I think you can, all of what I'm saying, you can go to an extreme, Right? But, but, but uh, in the Bible, respect those to whom respect is due is a very important value. And, and uh, 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 this is one of the results of discipline. Hebrews 12, 9 says, Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. We respected our parents because they disciplined us. Not at the time of discipline, but later. Later they realized that this was helpful. So, proper discipline fosters an attitude of respect. You know, and I think, um, uh, you know, the Bible, I have a whole list of places where the Bible talks about respect. My favorite one is Leviticus 12:32. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, right? Uh, but uh, there, are, there, are, there are a lot of places where we are told to respect our leaders. Many places where we are told to respect our leaders. Now, this is a value fast disappearing in society. For example, a teacher disciplines a child and the parents go and protest to the headmaster of the school. You know, and teachers' hands are tied. And the children learn not to respect authority. This is very serious. In fact, um, there's a problem with second-generation Christians. Uh, let me explain how this happens. Here's a, a, a father and a mother who grew up, who came to know Christ when they were young people. And in their youth fellowship, or in Youth for Christ, or wherever... There were all these rules, and they did it this way. Now the child has grown up, and the child is a teenager, and the child goes to youth fellowship, 
And the parents ask, now, have you done this? You mean to say you all don't do that now? What's the, what's the matter with these youth leaders, you know? And they start scolding the youth leaders in front of the children. What happens? The youth leaders are unable to, to be leaders because the ones who are most important in their life have, have, uh, abdic- have, have, have sort of canceled them off and said they are not worth, worth being leaders. So I think we need to be very careful. You know, it's a, it's a real challenge for a parent who loves their child to hand over their children to youth workers. Um, because you, you wonder, who, what does this guy know? How, how can he help my, my child? And, and we want to get in. Um, I'm a youth worker, and I was the head of Youth for Christ. And when my children were young people in youth clubs, and the leaders did things sometimes that we didn't really like that much, but we never expressed it to our children because they needed to be part of the group that they were in. So I think it's very important for us to, uh, to, to create an atmosphere where respect is something that is nice. I know respect has been abused. People have abused their privileges and expected people to, to, uh, uh, to respect them when they didn't deserve respect uh, and use that in a bad way. But uh, misuse doesn't, uh, abuse doesn't give an excuse for disuse, for no use at all. Um, So, when we come to the Ten Commandments, um, the first four commandments have to do with our relationship with God. The next six have to do with our relationships with with others. And the first of these is, honor your father and your mother. That your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. And Paul, describing that, says, this is the first commandment with a promise. So obviously, it's a very important aspect of, uh, of, of, of our lives. Okay, then, so we have... Uh, the, uh, I have to go back to my notes. Getting old now. <laughs> We have um, uh, don't provoke, encourage, and now, uh, and and then discipline, don't provoke and encourage are two uh, of the same, Uh, discipline, and then instruction, right? Um, Now, now here again, there is this idea of teaching. Um, uh, This word uh, instruction here has the idea of to provoke instruction as a correct behavior and belief, as to correct, correct, as to correct, you know, to change behavior and belief. The, the Greek word is neuthesia. And um, in, in other words, when you discipline, you just don't only discipline, you instruct. Why is this wrong? Why is this the best way? And we need to do our homework if necessary in order to guide them in this way. It's very interesting. Um, Proverbs 1.8 says, Listen to your mother's teaching and your father's instruction. Now, the word teaching is the word Torah, which is actually uh, the Bible. You know, the Old Testament uh, the, is the word for the first five books, but they used it for the word those days. So, so the mother... I mean, I, I don't, this is a Hebrew parallelism, so you can't make too much of a distinction between the two. However, I think the distinction is uh, interesting. One is to teach, the other is to instruct. One is to give the principle, to, t- to tell the word to the people, and the other applies this truth to the situations that children face. So they need to do their homework. Um, we, um, when we were, uh, when our children were growing up, I was particularly concerned about the advertisements, because a lot of the children's uh, way of, uh, philosophy grows out of the advertisements. So sometimes there'll be advertisements that are that are wrong, that give wrong prejudices. Uh, this is it's, it's uh, in Sri Lanka. If you're fair-skinned, you're nice. If you're Dark skinned, you're not so nice, you know. And so uh, I, I tell the children, can you see this? You know, how, and, and show them how wrong it is, 
you know, so that we, we talk about, and we talk about the songs that they sing. Uh, and then uh, they, they, were, they grew up with an English culture, English-speaking culture. So there would be these New Age things that were coming in. So I, I would tell them, now, this is New Age. And you, you, you need to, to bear in mind that this is the kind of... So, so we have to do our homework. We have to listen to the songs that are sung to the people that they, are, um, that, 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 that they idolize. Uh, and uh, so that the children can know the truth of Romans 12, 2. That you may prove what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect. Our people should know that the way we are giving to them is the best way. Good, acceptable probably in this context to God, acceptable to God, but perfect. In every way, it's the best possible thing. And that's the reason why we don't do this or do that because we have a better plan in mind. And so, uh, especially today, with the um, sexual orientation of society and the idea that you are free to express your sexuality, to, uh, to, uh, to nurture your sexuality outside marriage, you know, I think we have to tell our children, show our children why it is wrong why pornography, for example, is not helpful and, and, and why uh, it is uh, harmful to a happy life when you get married. You know, things like that. We need so that they have this. Uh, so, um, so we have this challenge of communicating the word of God to our children. The next, the next one is, uh, is actually... it's. Uh, uh, it's, uh, the, the ESV is not very clear here. Uh, well, it is clear, but uh, the, the word doesn't come out. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up, it says. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Uh, this word is translated in other translations as nourish. Nourish them. And uh, the the the... the the discipline is an aspect of nourishing or nurturing a person. The, the lexicon says this word has the idea of to raise a child to maturity, to maturity by providing for physical and psychological needs. So, so we, are, we, are, we are to provide for their physical and psychological needs. They should know that we are there for them, that we are committed to them, providing their needs, uh, studying up when they ask a question, and teaching them, not, uh, not discouraging them when they ask questions, supporting them when they are under attack. Uh, Warren Wearsby tells the story of a boy who uh, he was talking uh, to a group of young people and, the young, and he said how God is always there, always available. We can go to him any time we want. And then he told how he, when he was a pastor, he was a pastor of a large church, and the receptionist had been told, uh, whatever I'm doing, however busy I am, I may be at a meeting, if these people call, send them right through. Don't, uh, you know, however inconsequential the issue may be, just let them uh, put them on to me. And in that list was his children, his wife and his children. And, um, and that's the way God is, he said, you know, any time we can go to him. After the talk was over, this boy came up to him and said, Father, uh, Rev, um, Dr. Wearsby, would you adopt me? I'm trying so hard to get my father's attention, and I just can't get through to him. I need his encouragement so much. So we should be there. They should know that we are there. They should know that we are praying for them. I have a traveling ministry, but the children know that when I'm on the road, I'm praying for them. So if they have a problem, they tell my wife, tell father. Uh, you know, they know that, that I pray, and they have that thing, you know, that we pray. My, my son was very fond of cricket, so sometimes I drop him at a game, and always before we go, we pray. 
Uh, and one day I forgot. Uh, but he had not forgotten. So he was waiting and waiting and waiting for the prayer. And then when we were, I was driving, and when we were coming close to the grounds, uh, he said, will you pray for me, please? You know, and then I prayed. You know, they know that we pray. They should know that. Um, they, they should hear expressions of concern from us. Uh, you know, for example, you know, sometimes we can't be there. You know, in the ministry, especially for a guy like me who's traveling, very often for important times in my children's lives, I can't be there. And that's very sad. And when that happens, one of the things I have to remember is, I will never say, don't you realize that I have to do God's work? You know, because then they start getting angry with God, uh, that I'm not, we are not there. But rather, oh, I'm so sorry I can't come. I wish I could have come. And then we are not there, but we call, how did it go? How are you doing? How is the situation? Uh, and and, um, and th th this whole thing of um, they know that we care. You know, if we say things like, uh, you know, it's my duty, I have to do this. You know, we just, they end up resentful. You know, but if they know that their sorrow is shared by us, you know, one of the best ways to overcome bitterness is to share your sorrow. That's why if, if, uh, friends are one of the great antidotes to bitterness. If you have friends, the chance of you remaining bitter is, is, is not very strong because you can share with somebody and they help us. And if they know he's sad, I'm sad. And, uh, and uh, th th that does something to them. So, um, so uh, just uh, that uh, nourish. Physical and psychological. Uh, the child is going for a big event, and suddenly he realizes his shoes are not polished. And the father uh, says, let me polish the shoes, and he polishes the shoes, you know. Uh, then, you know, these are the things that tell them, oh, they are there for me. So here are four aspects of discipline. Don't provoke, don't, dis uh, rather, rather encourage, discipline, Instruct and nurture. Uh, I will very quickly go, uh, share some things about teaching our children. I all, all already said how important that is. Uh, but first let me say that in teaching, one of the biggest ways in which it is done is through our lives. Uh, but it's not exclusively through our life. Some people said uh, principles are caught and not taught. In the Bible, it's caught and taught, right? It's both. We have to teach, but we also have to live. So there's a very interesting sequence in uh, 2 Timothy 3, 10, and 11. Paul says, you have followed, the word is observed, you have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, and sufferings. You have seen, my life has been an open book. That's what he says. But those, all those, one of the commentaries uh, by uh, Mounts on, on this book, says almost all, the, uh, actually all those characteristics, you know, that he mentioned here, Paul gives as commands or advice or exhortations to Timothy. So what he's saying is, yeah, I'm asking you to do this, but then he says, you have seen me doing it. So our lives uh, are, are ways in which they see us. For, uh, I was, when I was very small, there was a preacher called Herbert Epp. Uh, I don't know whether you have heard the name Theodore Epp. He was the one who founded Back to the Bible. His son came and spoke. And he said about how uh, when they were children, uh, there was a time when father is praying. The door is closed, and everyone knows Father is praying. Don't disturb. You know? And then they grew up respecting God, because this is the time with God is very important. You know? And when they see us respecting God in this way, they develop a respect. In, in, my, in my life, my, my mother is a Buddhist. My mother and grandmother are Buddhist converts. But they were people of prayer. And every day I would see them praying. Naturally, I grew up 
you know, knowing that I must pray. And I also, that also helps us to develop a respect for God. You know, if we don't respect our appointment with God, they realize God is someone who can be, you know, it's okay, no problem. Uh, and, 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 and we lose that sense of respect for God. Uh, so, uh, so, we, uh, um, so people follow uh, us uh, when they, uh, the way we do. Uh, D.L. Moody tells a story about a child, uh, a little child. The, the, somebody rang the door bell, and, and they were in the kitchen. Mother and child were in the kitchen, and mother ran to uh, get the, uh, open the door. And one of the, when she ran, one of the tumblers, glasses fell. And when she came back, the daughter had broken all the glasses. Because that's what mother did. And I'm going to do the same thing, you know. So, uh, so they, uh, they, uh, children follow our uh, example, you know. Now, let me say that we are, nobody's perfect, you know, uh, there's a very comforting verse in James chapter 3 and verse 2. Verse 1 talks about ju- leaders being judged uh, more f- severely, teachers being judged more severely than others. That's very challenging. Verse 2 is very comforting. For we all stumble in many ways. All of us stumble. We make mistakes. And once we make a mistake, we apologize. And, and we say, I'm sorry. Um, Don Rubesh was a minister, missionary in our country uh, who started back to the Bible broadcast in Sri Lanka. And he, I remember him saying, when I was a teenager, I remember him saying, the four hardest words to say uh, in the home are, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. You know, it's hard to say that. But, um, you know, it has a way of lifting the situation takes away the pressure. You know, um, when I was, uh, when our children were small, uh, I was a leader of Youth for Christ, and there were some times when I was under a lot of pressure. And very often, uh, at home, in office, I somehow hold up. And when I come home, you know, uh, I get annoyed. Children are shouting, and I get annoyed. And I learned that when I'm under a lot of pressure, I tell the children that. I tell them, Listen, I'm under a lot of pressure, and if I uh, shout in a bad way, it's not because of you, but because I'm going through this pressure. You know, just to take that, the pressure out. You know, when somebody does wrong, there's a mist that comes upon a home. And apologizing takes that away. Okay, and then um, we have to teach them. I, I, my time is almost up. So I, I just want to say one thing uh, about teaching, you know, content. You know, um, uh, I, I can tell you, I have studied under some top Bible teachers. Uh, father of inductive Bible study, Robert Trainer. I studied under him and many others. But by far, the most influential teacher in my life was my mother. She never went to a Bible college. I don't think she ever did a course on how to study the Bible. She just taught us the Bible. And my wife did that with our children. I think there is no uh, substitute for that. Parents teaching their children. It doesn't have to be the mother who does it. The father uh, can do it uh, too. Uh, But um, uh, the, the point I want to make now is something, uh, I, I was walking with uh, Mike, I was driving back with Mike Woods, Mike Woods, and uh, we were talking about various things and uh, something clicked uh, when, when we were talking and this afternoon I put it into my new book that I'm writing. <laughs> uh, we were talking about why the children of evangelical parents are rejecting the evangelical ethic, right? For example, uh, oh, I'm heterosexual in my beliefs, in my uh, orientation, and that's what I like. But what's wrong with others expressing their 
inclination, following their inclination. You know, what's wrong with that? Now, a lot of, lot of young people are doing that. The churches are doing that. And what's at the heart of it? No respect for the word. You know, the word has been, become uh, something they go to for inspiration, not for instruction. You know, in the Bible it says, I hope I have, found, I have got, I got this passage. Uh, it, it says in the Bible uh, that, um, this is in Hebrew, uh, Isaiah 60, 60 something. Uh, the, those who are, hum- that God is pleased with those who are humble and who tremble at his word. I think, I think we need to teach, and, and in, in Deuteronomy, many times, it talks 11 times, it says in Deuteronomy, that the Bible was given to God, the law was given to God in the fire. You know, it was a, uh, it was a supernatural revelation from God. And I think our people need to know that the Bible, how important the Bible is, and how scared we are to disobey the Bible. The fear of God and the fear of disobedience. When, when the Bible becomes a source book of inspiration rather than the textbook for living, we are going to get into big trouble. So I think parents should be bearing this in mind. We are living in a world that is postmodern, that does not consider objective truth to be important. We have to show that objective truth is important. Now, in a postmodern generation, the way to show that may be through story and through subjective things. It can be from subjective to, exp- uh, you know, you know, those days we learned fact, faith, feelings. Today people are saying feelings, faith, fact. Whatever the progression, what's important is the fact that the Bible says something. So whatever way we teach them, and I think the best way to teach is through the stories of the Old Testament. You know, they they give us the whole biblical worldview. uh, That we teach our children to to respect the word. Uh, The Muslims have that. You know, I remember I was preaching in Pakistan, it's a Muslim country. I had just landed at 5 o'clock in the morning from, uh, from Amsterdam, went straight for a service, and I put the Bible on the floor. And someone came up, I was on the platform, someone came up and quietly said to me, can you please lift up your Bible? From the Muslims, the Christians had learned to respect their word. Now, I know cultures are different, but there is something here that we respect the word and we are scared, we tremble at the thought of trying to fight what is found in the word. We need, to, we need our children to have that sense.